Our other top story tonight, the United States' top diplomat will travel to Turkey tomorrow as he continues his mission for answers about what happened to missing journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Mike Pompeo sat down with the king and crown prince of Saudi Arabia today as Mr Khashoggi's family called for an international commission to investigate his suspected murder. Tonight, Donald Trump said he'd spoken to Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, promising that answers will be forthcoming shortly. Crossing to Washington shortly for the latest there in a moment. First from Riyadh, our diplomatic editor Dominic Wycorn reports. Smiles between Prince and Envoy. But this is deadly serious, because Mike Pompeo's host here is suspected of state-sponsored murder. After he met Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and his father, the US Secretary of State said he urged them to launch a thorough, transparent and timely investigation that provides answers. The family of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi want more than that. In a statement saying the strong moral and legal responsibility which our father instilled in us obliges us to call for the establishment of an independent and impartial international commission to inquire into the circumstances of his death. Here in Saudi Arabia, there is a deafening silence about it. No one dares talk publicly, it seems, from the street to the most senior levels of government. The situation is so sensitive, we've been told not to talk to ordinary Saudis about it because of fear it could land them in trouble. But on social media, they have expressed shock and disbelief about what their leadership's accused of and a sense of fear and anxiety about what it could mean for the future. Key business figures are pulling out from this year's meeting of international investors in Riyadh, nicknamed Davos in the Desert, with a slew of media organisations, including the Financial Times, Bloomberg and the New York Times, dropping sponsorship. More and more prominent business figures won't be going, including HSBC and Uber CEOs and media and tech bosses. And the Saudis will be deeply worried by this. A Republican senator wants their friend and ally furious and threatening retribution. We're going to sanction the hell out of Saudi Arabia. You know, we deal with bad people all the time, but this is in our face. I feel personally offended. They have nothing but contempt for us. Why would you put a guy like me and the president in this box right. after all the president has done? This guy's got to go. Crown Prince, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. President. Donald Trump has given almost unconditional support to the young Saudi prince, impressed with his promise to modernize his country. Analysts say he's now paying for it. He came to rely on Saudi Arabia for his Middle East strategy, and now for this to happen, um, it just makes him look bad. It, it makes it seem like the big bet he took on MBS was a pretty bad bet. Mike Pompeo flies on to Turkey, where police searches in Istanbul reportedly continue unearthing fresh evidence. The Trump administration and Saudis want this all over and quickly. It may not be that easy. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News, in Riyadh. Well, let's get more on this story from our US correspondent, Amanda Walker. And this is important, Amanda, on many levels. So can the US and Saudi Arabia come up with answers that will satisfy those outraged by this apparent murder? I think the pressure is mounting on that, certainly. Donald Trump, the latest he's had to say on this is uh, in an interview that will be broadcast later, that if they knew about it, that would be bad. But every indication that he's given so far is that he believes the denials. Let's take a look at what he said on Twitter earlier. Uh, just spoke with the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, who totally denied any knowledge of what took place in their Turkish consulate. He was with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo during the call and told me that he is already already started and will rapidly expand a full and complete investigation into this matter. Answers will be forthcoming shortly. There is a lot at stake here for the US, arguably more uh, for Saudi Arabia in this situation. Lucrative arms deals, uh, the aim to cut off exports from Iranian oil. They need Saudi Arabia to do that. So there is the sort of policy side of things, which certainly Donald Trump has emphasized 
economic and security ones being the priority for him. But then there's also this very close relationship. Saudi Arabia was his first stop on his first foreign trip. We know that his son-in-law has a close personal relationship with the crown prince. Uh, but even with all that in mind, it would not be a good look for the United States uh, to be um, so close to a potential pariah in this situation. Um, but Donald Trump saying, uh, really hedging his bets a little bit there, saying that if they knew it would be bad, but so far he seems to be um, reiterating, not just uh, believing, but reiterating uh, what the Saudis have had to say on this so far, even going as far as he did yesterday, saying that it may be a rogue killer. Well, the Saudi leadership, already under pressure because of its uh, actions uh, in Yemen, is now facing growing international criticism following the disappearance and suspected killing of a Saudi journalist. Jamal Khashoggi was last seen a fortnight ago at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. The US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, has held talks with the King of Saudi Arabia and the Crown Prince to express his concern about what's happened. And Turkey has already accused a Saudi hit squad of killing Mr Khashoggi and disposing of his body. Our diplomatic correspondent, James Robbins, has the latest. The arrival of an American Secretary of State to see Saudi King Salman isn't usually so uncomfortable. Donald Trump sent Mike Pompeo to get answers about Jamal Khashoggi's disappearance. But the crucial encounter was with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, many hold responsible. President Trump telephoned that during their talks. He reported the Crown Prince totally denying any knowledge of what took place, promising a complete investigation. Yeah. Thank you for hosting me. But could the truth still be covered up behind diplomatic immunity? The United Nations insists it must not be. Under international law, both a forced disappearance and an extrajudicial killing are very serious crimes, and immunity should not be used to impede investigations into what happened and who is responsible. It's now two weeks since Jamal Khashoggi disappeared into Saudi Arabia's consulate in Istanbul. Turkish police have finally been able to search it. Their detailed evidence is yet to be published, but Saudi Arabia's traditional allies are threatening punishment without wanting to destroy valuable relations. Saudi Arabia is a major market for arms sales from the United States and Britain. 61% of all Saudi weapons purchases come from the United States and some 23% from the United Kingdom. Their joint sales completely dwarf the figure from all other suppliers. What else makes Saudi Arabia a key partner? Well, its position as the world's biggest oil exporter is key, sitting on almost a fifth of global reserves. And Western powers stress Saudi Arabia is crucial as a source of intelligence and as an ally in the fight against extremist violence, particularly from so-called Islamic State. Both Theresa May and Jeremy Hunt insist Saudi Arabia has helped keep people on the streets of Britain safe. For more than a half century, both the United States and the UK have turned to Saudi Arabia because it's a lot easier to do things with Saudi Arabia on your side than when Saudi Arabia is against you. Here in the heart of Mayfair, Saudi Arabia has one of the most palatial embassies in London. Consistent with its vast wealth and power, and also its importance to Britain and the West. But Britain is increasingly on the defensive about that closeness. First because of Saudi actions in Yemen, and now because the disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi means it has somehow to find a way of projecting outrage while at the same time protecting the fundamental relationship. There's no doubting widespread public anger against Saudi Arabia and other states accused of contempt for international rules. That means governments in democracies pledged to protect those rules are under growing pressure too. James Robbins, BBC News. Saudi Arabia's crown prince tonight totally denied in a phone call with President Trump that he knows what happened to dissident journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Mohammed bin Salman also promised to expand the investigation as the Turkish president claimed investigators had more evidence of Mr Khashoggi's murder. It's being reported here tonight that this is the Saudi consul leaving his Istanbul residence this afternoon to head to the airport for a flight to Riyadh. If he is gone, then his departure comes as Turkish investigators extend their search for evidence from the consulate to his residence. 
Not long after Jamal Khashoggi walked into the consulate, never to be seen outside it again, cameras also picked up Saudi vehicles driving from the consulate to the residence. The Turks suspect Mr Khashoggi's remains were disposed of there. After being shut out by the Saudis for almost a fortnight, Turkish investigators are now busy. And today, President Erdogan hinted that Saudi attempts to erase all incriminating evidence at the consulate have failed. He said toxins had been found, as well as new paint jobs here and there. The pressure on the Saudis increased in Riyadh as well today, with the arrival there of U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. He met the king first, but the main focus of attention will be the power behind the throne, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He said their two countries were strong and old allies. We face lots of challenges together. But rarely a challenge of this magnitude and delicacy. Tomorrow, Mike Pompeo will fly here to try to broker a way out of this crisis. The Turks won't tolerate a whitewash. So what's needed is a credible explanation for Mr Khashoggi's death. And while that explanation can't put the Saudi regime totally in the clear, it can't put a critical ally beyond the pale either. John Irvine, News at 10, Istanbul. Now, the idea that drugs are helping to fuel increasing levels of violent crime, particularly in rural areas, is one we have reported on many times in recent months. In the past week, it's been at the heart of a police operation that has seen more than 200 arrests being made and dozens of vulnerable people who are often used by dealers to sell their drugs being taken into care. But despite those efforts, analysis by ITV News has found the numbers of crimes involving knives or guns has increased since 2013 by as much as 330% in Norfolk, while areas covered by Cleveland police in the northeast increased by more than 80% and in Bedfordshire by almost as much, putting increasing pressure on police there. Supposedly this is a rural police force, but it doesn't feel that way to these officers. Since 2014, Bedfordshire has actually seen a surge in the kind of violent crime normally associated with our major cities. Trying to contain this violence frequently brings officers right to hospital bedsides. Police believe this young man had been hospitalised because of a drug dispute. Here in Bedfordshire, they think much of the violence has been driven by a rivalry between organised crime groups selling drugs. And so this morning, Bedfordshire police are targeting two houses. In the last few weeks, they've seen an escalation in guns fired between drug selling networks. Today, they intend to take out an enforcer, a man whose job is to use violence to keep order. They've raided the suspect's house. He is not there. You can see his family instead is being led into the van. Indeed, a young boy went past me in tears. He's clearly just been woken up and it's a real shock for him. But this means that somebody they suspect of using weapons across Bedfordshire in the last four weeks is still on the run. Earlier in the year, this knife fight broke out in Luton's shopping centre, including a boy wielding a machete. Two of them were stabbed. One only survived because an ex-army medic was in the area. Now they're all in prison, sentenced to as long as seven years. What scares me, what makes me really concerned is that actually it's really um, spontaneous and it's in public places, in broad daylight, and there's no thought. It's just so spontaneous. It's right, I've been upset or I've got this problem with this person and boom, it's there. So in terms of policing it, it's really difficult to get that handle on where it's going to happen next. It's the shopping centres of Luton, but also Bedfordshire's sleepier villages. This man is a retired police officer, and after 25 years, he's planning to move. It's quite incredible to think they're that brazen that they'll do it just there. I mean, it's a nice area, and literally a car pulled up on the side of the road, on the footpath over there. Another car pulled up just outside here, and we went in quite verbally, uh, aggressively in towards them, said that we knew they were drug dealing, said we knew they were buying drugs and selling drugs, told them to get out of our street in some very colourful language. Shanita Lendor's little brother Isaac was stabbed to death in Bedford four years ago. It is becoming the new normal and I think a lot of the time these young people are planning to hurt the person or scare the person. 
they don't actually plan to kill them. So, I mean, in Isaac's case, they did plan to kill them, but not in all of these cases. Most cases, it's to give them that fear factor or just to hurt them and teach them a lesson. Mm -hmm. They're not actually planning to kill them, and then it goes too far once they get there. Since Isaac's murder, Shanita Lendor has devoted herself to helping young people, hoping lessons will be learned from her brother's death. But the increase in violence suggests she hasn't yet got her wish. Alega Stratton, News at 10, Bedfordshire.